welcome everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to be with us and to share in this, I think, very important chapter of Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, in that it's really telling the gospel message from the beginning to the end. The gospel message of the Bible, that is, not necessarily the, what you might call the traditional Bible message that is heard in many places today, but the full gospel, as you know in the book of Ezekiel, that there is much judgment portrayed here by the Lord. But in this, we, we should, by, by listening to the Lord here in this message, we should get a, a greater appreciation for the judgments of the Lord. They're for a specific purpose. And the purpose of God is to draw us to him. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. But what's amazing about this is it's, it's uh, I believe, 63 verses long in this Ezekiel 16. It's a long chapter. But in the last four verses, it talks about restoring the people, meaning the people of God, Israel, and establishing them in an everlasting covenant. So we must go into the Bible and seek the Lord for his meaning of this chapter, which is much more than just what you might see on the surface, where the Lord portrays Israel as um, at the beginning uh, of their birth, liken Israel to the birth of an individual, and that she was just a, a, a useless discard at her birth. Thrown aside, you might say, and nobody cared. But the Lord came along and moved upon her and she became a very beautiful woman. And he nourished her and she became strong and envy of the world. And he tells about his marriage to her. And then she turned from him and began to commit whoredom uh, with the other nations of the world and their idols so that he had to judge her severely, very severely. And then as the Lord is talking about all of this judgment, right at the very end, he talks about restoring her. And it's very obvious that as he does this, it's obvious that he restores only the repentant which is exactly the gospel message. And this is very true, this message is very true to all of the other messages of the Bible that talk about the birth, the growth in the Lord, and then the turning from the Lord, the judgment, and then the call of the Lord to come back, and those who do are called the remnant. This is very, very true. And it, 
this this story is pointing to the end time because it talks about an everlasting covenant and that happens at the end time so we see through this that the judgment part is actually a type here that the judgment of babylon and the judgment of being scattered out throughout the world is a type of the end time tribulation period which will be the the most uh terrible time of all that ever will be in in the world that ever has been or ever will be but the promise of restoring Israel will come out of it and we'll find out here that it's not only Israel that he's going to save at that time but he's going to be calling the remnant from every nation but we start out with looking at Israel here, I'm going to turn to the first few verses of Ezekiel 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. We see here that the Lord is telling Ezekiel that he wants Ezekiel to show Jerusalem, the inhabitants there, their abominations. Verse 3 said, And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father is an Amorite, and thy father uh, an Hittite. Now, Canaan land is known for one of the most abominable uh, groups of people, uh, the most rebellious and, and ruthless people that the Lord is leading, the, had led the people into and to, to overcome the Canaanites and to take the land for themselves because the Lord had given to them. Verse four said, and as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee, thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee, pitied thee, to do any of these things unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. It's talking about Israel. It's talking about the people that Israel has called to be his own people, but this is before, so it is talking about before they really were what the Bible calls a people. In other words, they're called out of the Gentiles. Abraham was called out of the Gentiles. This must start with Abraham. And so we'll go back and we'll look through the notes. And I might say, very happily that these are actually Rod's notes that he ministered on a couple of weeks ago as he was coming to the end of the book of Revelation. He was, he was not at the end yet, but he was, he was close to the end. He was, he was in uh, chapters uh, 16, 17, 18, Talking about the tribulation and the, and, and the abominable uh, Babylon, uh, etc., being destroyed. And this is where the time that the Jewish people will be restored. Right now, they are blinded because of their rebelliousness. 
and God is using them very heavily and greatly to wake up the Gentile and the Gentile is supposed to be causing the Jewish people to be jealous and all of this is the plan of God to bring everyone back to him to bring everyone into a into a intimate relation with him that he so much desires and we notice that the title here at the top that He's going to gather those that are sorrowful. It's talking about those that are repentant. So I want to take you to uh, Zephaniah as Zephaniah prophesied this very thing in, in Zephaniah 2 and Zephaniah 3. And here it talks, the, the Lord is telling Zephaniah to speak to the people, gather yourselves together. Here the Lord is asking the Jewish people to gather themselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Why were they not desired? Because they had been rebellious. They hadn't received his word. They hadn't walked in his truth. Verse 2, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as a shaft, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So here the Lord is preaching the gospel to those people in that time frame calling them to the altar to come and come to him before it's too late, before the judgment time. He says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. When he says, you have wrought his judgment. Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Those of you who want to receive the Lord and have not walked with him, you've wrought the judgment, brought judgment upon you. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It's amazing how gracious and wonderful and kind our Lord is, even though his holiness demands judgment for those who do not follow him. So we go back to the notes and we see that in chapter three, um, let's see, I'll go back to here and just go to chapter three of Zephaniah. In the first, I want, I'm gonna read, even though it's not in the notes, I'm gonna read this. It actually is in the notes if we, the, the notes ask us to read both chapters two and three, and you should do this. I wouldn't have time to cover all of this today if I did that, but I'm gonna bring you the main parts that will prove the message of the gracious God that he is, and to make us, to help us to understand his move in our lives that are effective today in the same process, the same method that he's used from day one to bring people back to him. Verse one says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted in the oppressing city. 
She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. He's not going to have any part of it. But look at this. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. Every morning he does bring his judgment to light. He, he brings loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment to everyone as they respond to him so that everyone will be judged in the very same way. Lord, help me to, to be able to Explain this thoroughly so that everyone understands. He shows loving kindness to those who are meek, those who are repentant. He actually shows loving kindness by preaching damnation of those who do not follow him. That's the loveness of God, the loving God that we serve. He manifests righteousness in those that do accept him because they live a righteous life in him. That's the only way he will accept them. And he manifests judgment on those who rebel against him because of his justness, his righteousness, his holiness. And all of it is a move of God to bring us to the awareness of our need and reach out and accept him and his word as the answer for our lives. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth not. They knoweth no shame. Those that will not follow, they don't get it. They're not even ashamed of what they do. All right, I want to go down to verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. Here he's speaking again about the end time. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. He's talking about at the time of the tribulation period. To pour upon them mine indignation. This is the terrible tribulation period. Even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. See, the Lord is going to gather the nations and all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of his jealousy. That's the tribulation period. That includes both Jews and Gentiles, all the earth. And so this is the final thing when the Lord says he will not be a part of iniquity. He's the Lord will take care of wickedness in a very short order when he comes. It's speaking about the tribulation period when Christ comes back the second time to touch down on earth. When he does that, then his fierce wrath, the wrath of Almighty God will be poured out by him with a sword out of his mouth Wickedness shall be destroyed and he will begin to set up his kingdom and call his people unto him. Verse 9 says, 
Therefore, then will I turn to the people of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one consent. What a powerful verse. At that time, when he removes all this wickedness, when he destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet, when he ties up Satan, change him for a thousand years, and, and sets up his kingdom, he will bring a pure language to the people. In other words, all the nations there with different languages, those that are left from the fire of his anger shall have one language that they all may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. That word consent is a powerful statement in this verse because it proves that God is not doing this without our consent. It shows that it is the will of man has so much to do with whether they're saved or not. The God is not willing that any should perish. This one consent reminds me of the day of Pentecost when the, the people that were obeying God were in the upper room there seeking the Lord with one accord. They were in one accord. And the people that are left after this, this fire indignation of the Lord will be given a, a language so that each will understand each other. There'll be no more different languages of the different nations and they'll all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Oh, hallelujah. Go down to verse 16. In that day, the day of the Lord, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful, repentant, for the solemn assembly. They're very serious about this. Who are of thee, meaning Israel, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. This is, they recognize the Christ that they crucified the Messiah that they've spurned and shunned and, and rejected. And that certainly was a burden and is a burden to national Israel today, even though there are many Jewish people that are saved. But nationally, they need to come to the Lord and have the blinders taken from their eyes. Behold, at that time, the time of the Lord, the day of the Lord, I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that haldeth and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. I'll bring you out of slavery. I'll turn back your captivity before your eyes. Praise the Lord. Zephaniah prophesied, prophesied this. Now, the time of this prophecy here in Ezekiel was about 
500 or 550 or 60 years before Christ at this particular time. All of the people of Judah had not yet gone to Babylon, but very shortly they all will go there. At the time of this prophecy, so the Lord is telling them that they need to come to him so that they wouldn't have to go into slavery. But uh, the plan here is that the Lord will judge his enemies and restore Israel back to himself at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the key right there. The Lord will judge Israel's enemies. That's what we just read. And restore Israel back to himself at the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end time. At the second coming of Christ when he comes in great power and glory. And so what's important here, the, the Lord is telling us throughout the New Testament that we need to look for his appearing. Those who love his appearing. We're looking forward to the coming of Christ. For Christ to come at any moment. When he comes. It will be first in the rapture when he comes to pick up his bride. He will not come down on earth at that time. He'll be in the clouds and call his beautiful bride that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In other words, those who have walked with him here on earth. And then seven years later, after the tribulation period, will come back as the wife of the Lord, with the Lord at the time that he destroys the Antichrist and sets up his kingdom on earth. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Here's Peter reminding us of what we should know, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Mindful of the words of the prophets of the Old Testament and the words of the apostles in the New Testament. The words of the Lord. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're saying it's not going to happen. I don't see any sign of him coming back for the end time. Verse 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the Lord, notice that, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. They're willingly ignorant of that. They refuse that. That's the record that God has given us. And it's the truth. Verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store. You can rest assured that no one's going to destroy this world completely, but the Lord himself. Regardless of how many, how, how terrible and wicked and far off into transhumanism and everything else they get, this world that is now is kept in store by the same word, the word of God, reserved under the fiery judgment of the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. That's when it will be taken care of. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is 
Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years of one day. He's speaking only of that. He's not talking about everything. It's, every day is a thousand years. It's just that it makes no difference to the Lord whether it's one day or a thousand years. He is going to perform his word. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, into which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the element shall melt with a fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This is the day of the Lord, which is a time period, not 24 hours. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Should we be godly people? Should God's people walk as God's people? Seeing all of these things are going to be dissolved, and the reason they're dissolved is because of wickedness. Do you think it might be a wise thing to do for us to walk in the power of God's word and truth? Amen. And here's another thing. Looking for and hasting under the coming of the day of God, wherein the heaven shall, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, the promise of his word, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, not perverseness, not wickedness and evil, but righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. You know what diligent means. Be diligent that you may be found in him, of him, in peace, without spot or blameless. That couldn't be any clearer. Very, very explicit and plain. Make sure that your anchor holds. Make sure that you're found of him in peace. Because he's not going to be in peace for those that are perverts. No way. Not those that rebel against him. Not those that walk outside of his word. He's coming for those that are without spot and blameless. Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, the same thing, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned doesn't mean that they're uneducated. It means that they refuse the word of God and they're unstable, they wrestle. They wrestle with the word, as they do also with the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, before beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. You once saved, always saved people, you better read 2 Peter chapter 3. And yet you better believe that even though Jesus Christ paid the price for you, for every sin, it is your responsibility to walk in that freedom. And if you do not, you will be held accountable for your sin. Thus saith the Lord, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forevermore. Amen.
Praise God for the truth. So the Lord's going to gather these two types of people. He's going to He's going to gather, like we read in Zephaniah, those that are repentant, those that are sorrowful, and He's also going to gather the nations, as we read also. And as He gathers the nations, and they go through this judgment time, He's going to save, as it says in Matthew twenty-five verses. 31 through 46. Only those who have been kind to the Jewish people are going to enter the kingdom. That day, that day, the day of the Lord, includes the kingdom as well. That Christ comes the second time is the day of his vengeance. So, as we look at this, we see that this is the judgment of God. This is the move of God. This is the righteous move of God. This is the just judgment. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had true justice in our courts today? In our government today? Wouldn't it be wonderfully, uh, a wonderful experience to have our government the way that worked the way that the Lord gave it to us in a just manner and not not a corrupted manner like it is today. But anyway, we've got to start, as I said in the beginning, with Abraham because Ezekiel 36 starts out as a people that were discards. In other words, they weren't recognized as God's people. Starts with Abraham. You remember that he was called to come out of his country and that God would make him a great nation and he would, he would bless those that blessed him and curse those that cursed him. And he would also give him a land and that he went, he obeyed. I'm going to go right into the covenant with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse thee that curses thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There is what the Lord called Abram to do. And in that, he promised him a land, a, he'd be a great nation, and the blessing would be on his seed as well, his posterity, and that the whole world would be blessed by him. That's in those three verses of Genesis chapter 12. Now, this is the covenant called the covenant with Abraham. The covenant is something that is an agreement that requires both parties to participate in and be faithful to. We notice here that the Lord told Abram to get out of the country, away from his people, away from his father's people, and go into a land that I will show you. This is the gospel. Come out of the world, 
leave that world, that world of corruption behind you and go where the Lord shows you. That is speaking about the new land, the land of the Lord, a land that where righteousness dwells. The gospel is telling us to turn away from the old life and to enter the new life and to live the new life in this corrupt world so that we'll be able to be accepted when he gives us the new world, when he renovates this world, destroys the old one, and brings us the new heavens and the new earth. So thou make thee a great nation, O oh, bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That means his, his, his uh, entire, he's going to bless him to be a great nation. He'll bless them that bless them and curse them that curse them. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is the gospel message because it's his seed as we will see as we go through the extensions of these covenants that the way that all nations will be blessed is through the seed, which is Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ is a biological descendant of Abraham. And so on the first, on the concerning the land, the Palestinian government is the extension of that one. God will regather Israel from the scattering. Why were they scattered? because of their disobedience, because they refuse to follow God. He will circumcise their heart and give them an eternal restoration. Amen. Let's look at that. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3 through 5. And then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity bring you out of slavery and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. And if any of thine be driven out into the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. This promise will be fulfilled in the kingdom after the tribulation period. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel, in chapter 36, Says, says this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it. As son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as an uncleanness, as a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they have shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. And according to the doings, I judge them. So it's saying the same thing. That was a Palestinian covenant that he will bring them back and restore them. 
David's seat on the throne, the Davidic covenant, extension of the seed, the promise that he be have many descendants. You can read all of this. I don't have time to go through it all now, but this, this is laid out so perfectly so that, that you can understand the importance of this covenant. Otherwise, we could never come to this promise justly where the Lord says, I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. It's all fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ and our willingness to accept him and his way. That's the way this is all fulfilled. It's not God just snapping his finger and these things happen, but he's faithful. He makes a covenant with the faithful. The faithful follow through and the faithful are blessed. Those that are, don't follow through, he makes an, an extension for them and says, I'll bring you back. What he's speaking of is those that turn to him, the sorrowful, the repentant. I need to get down here to the new covenant, which is an extension of being a worldwide blessing in verse 3 of Genesis 12. To Israel and Judah, no psychology. The law is written in the heart. All will know God. That's, you remember that it, that's very uh, well spoken of in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come saith the Lord that I will make a, co a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which by covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Not that way, he says. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Because they were repentant at the end of that tribulation period. And he gives them a pure language so that everybody, Jews and Gentiles, can call on the Lord and serve him with one consent. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful book we have in the Bible. I must hurry here. In Galatians 3 shows the Abrahamic covenant in the New Testament. It's an interpreted, it's interpreted rather in Galatians 3. Verse 6 says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. We didn't have time to go through those scriptures. Abraham obeyed the Lord. He came out of the country, came out of his father's house, went to a land that the Lord led him to that he didn't even know where he's going until he was shown. He obeyed the Lord and so the Lord followed through and blessed him 
to be the father of the righteous people through Christ. Abraham had to grow in the Lord and he walked in the understanding that the Lord gave him and the Lord led him all the way and every time the Lord showed him something, he obeyed and followed. That's the key. Verse seven says, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. That's, that's the promise to the Gentile. Anybody who takes this by faith and follows the Lord as Abraham did will become the child of Abraham spiritually. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Remember, that's what I told you when we read that covenant. He was preaching the gospel to Abraham, and Abraham received it. Verse 9, chapter 3 of Galatians, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. But again, it is definitely necessary to mention that Abraham just didn't merely believe God. He did what God asked him to do. And he, and verse 29 and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you receive Christ, if you belong to him, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. What promise? The blessing that is on Abraham. Glory be to God. You receive the inheritance of the Lord. You'll be welcomed into that promised land, the kingdom of the Lord God. Oh, there's so much that I'm unable to cover here in this day that I wanted to bring you. Look at this, it's all laid out for you. Moses prophesied of God's jealousy being poured out in Deuteronomy 32, is told again in Romans 11. Moses prophesied of that prophet, you remember? You remember when the Lord said, told uh, Moses that he's gonna raise up a prophet that would he would give the word to and the word would be required of those that he, that he brought the word to? And how in John 12, the Lord said that he's that prophet. And if anybody hears his word and follows them, that he, he, they would be blessed, but those that did not would be judged by the word. That's a fulfillment of that prophecy right there. And then where the prophet, meaning Jesus, instructs his disciples on the same day that he rose from the dead, after he'd risen and ascended into heaven and, and, and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven at the throne of Almighty God, and he came back and I, I want to read part of this at least before we close. The same day at evening, meaning the same day that he rose from the dead, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them unto them his hands and his side, where he had been pierced with the nails and the spear. 
Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. The father sent Jesus to bring the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus brought the word. And then he says, and when, and then he says, even as the Father sent me, so I send you. The same way, we are to bring the word. Not just receive it, not just believe it, but to speak the word, to spread the word. When he had said thus, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Which means that marvelous experience when we come to be one with our Savior through repentance and through acceptance of his shed blood for forgiveness of our sins. We are given the Holy Spirit to abide within us so that we can speak that word. I haven't got time to go on how he tells us to to be in order to be a witness to the world, we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which the disciples did by waiting for them on the day of Pentecost. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. Deuteronomy tells us, Moses tells us about the importance of God's word. Chapter 6. Now these are the commandments and statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land wherewith you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statements, statutes and commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Now, therefore, O Israel, observe to do them, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of our fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord our God, thy God, with all thine heart, all thy soul, all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlet between thy eyes, and write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, into the kingdom, which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and mighty cities which thou buildest not. So on and so on and so on and so on. The importance of God's holy word. How we're supposed to treat it, how we're supposed to do it, and how we're supposed to teach it to our children. So the people didn't do that, and so they had to be removed. The first time the Bible speaks of two removals, Isaiah prophesied the first removal, which is the, the, um, the captivity of Babylon. They went into slavery there in Babylon for 70 years. And then the return was also prophesied by Isaiah. And Isaiah also prophesied the second return that day, Isaiah 11. I am... Picking and choosing here. 
to finish this up. This is the second return. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The branch, of course, is Jesus. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall lay down with the lamb that goes from the coming of the Lord, the ministry of the Lord, clear through into the kingdom where the new heavens and the new earth, where the, the animal kingdom is changed, where the lion lays down with the, with the uh, lamb and the lamb and the leopard lie down together, et cetera, and et cetera. So it tells the whole story. Now, so whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's telling the same story. Matthew 13, 52 says, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and old. In this case, the Old Testament or New Testament, the, what the prophet said, what the apostles say, what Christ says. Christ is speaking through both of them. So the point that I must say before I close is why did God call these people to be his servants knowing they would walk away from him? The answer is he will be glorified. How is that going to happen? The Lord speaks through Isaiah again, saying that the Lord's purpose is to be glorified. Let me read these five verses. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he held, hid me, and made me a polished shaft in his quiver, hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. How is he going to be glorified? He's not going to be glorified by a rebellious people, a people he has to destroy through judgment but he's going to be glorified in the meek. Those that are sorrowful, those that are repentant, those that love him, those that follow him, those are the ones he'll be glorified in when he comes. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. He's saying, Jesus is saying, I died on the cross, but what good did it do? I spent my life, and what good did it do? The answer here is in Psalms 2, Acts 8, where the Lord says, This day have I begotten my son as king, the king, on Mount Zion, speaking of the kingdom, the Jesus Christ in the kingdom, and when he returns, bringing the Holy Ghost upon his disciples that will spread the word the same as he did. 
Verse five, now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Speaking of that end time, speaking when the salvation of those that follow him will be obvious to the entire world when he brings us back with him because we followed him here on earth. And he said, verse six, it's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. That's the remnant. The preserved of Israel are those that follow the Lord. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Speaking of Jesus Christ and the opening up of the door of salvation for the Gentiles through him. Praise the Lord. Let me continue to finish this quickly. He starts out in verse 6 of Ezekiel. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, Thou wast in thy blood live. Yea, I said unto thee that thou hast in thy blood live. In other words, the Lord spoke under this, under this people that was worthless, discarded, and said, live. And then the next verse 7 says, I have caused thee the blessing of the Lord to multiply as the bud of the flea field, and thou hast increased and waxed great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Remember I told you, he's likening Israel to a, a, a person. And here, he's, she's to become a beautiful woman, a bride to the Lord. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was a time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, covered thy nakedness, yea, I swear unto thee, Swear unto thee, the covenant entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Praise God, one with the Lord. Then washed I thee with water, the word, the living water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee and anointed thee with oil, the oil of the Holy Ghost. I clothed thee also with broidered work shod thee with badger skin, girded thee about with fine linen, covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel in thy forehead, earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was fine linen and silk, Embroidered work, thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. Speaking of Israel, and thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, envy of the world, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and placed the harlot because of thy renown and poured out thy fornications on everyone that passed by, as it was. Gave yourself away to wickedness. And, by thy, and of thy garments thou didst take and deckest thy high places with diverse colors, placed the harlot thereupon. The like things shall not come 
neither shall it be so. I'm not going to put up with it. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels and my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them. The world. Thou tookest thy broidered garments and coverest them, and thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them, offering up my incense and my oil to them, these false gods. My meat also, which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, the word of the living God, wherewith I fed thee. Thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God. People that use the word of God unjustly, blank, promising um, salvation to the wicked, to those that are sinful, those that are disobedient. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and daughters whom thou hast born unto me and hast sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter, that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them? And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou wast naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood? And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place, hast made thee an high place in every high street. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and hast opened thy feet to everyone that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, greater flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee, and I have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable, Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and thou couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan, unto Chaldea, clear over to Babylon, into the false religion of the Chaldeans, committing fornication there, spiritual fornication. Yet thou wast not satisfied therewith. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou didst all these things the work of an imperious, boorish woman. Imperious means arrogant, prideful, boastful, unrepentant, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot, in that thou scornest ire, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. You're trying not to be a whore, but you're committing adultery like somebody who is leaving her husband for other relationships. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee, from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms. They're not following thee to commit whoredoms, and if thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. You do everything backwards. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations, 
and the blood of thy children which thou didst give unto them. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated. And I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all thy nakedness. And I will judge thee as a woman that break wedlock and shed blood on the judge. And, and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. I will also give thee into their hand and they shall throw down thine imminent place and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes so take away thy fair jewels and leave thee naked and bare. The talking here of Israel being like a whorish, rebellious wife. That's, that's all using this metaphorical uh, terminology here because of their spiritual abominations and fornications, leaving the Lord. They shall also bring up a company against thee. They shall stone thee with stones and, and thrust thee through with their swords. That's the judgment that the, 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 those, those poor misguided persons have been going through for centuries. And they shall burn thy houses with fire, execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women, and I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou also shalt give no hire any more. So will I make my fury toward thee to rest. Here's a first glimpse of the let up on the judgment. And my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet, and will be no more angry. And then it goes on, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I also recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God. And thou shalt not commit this lewdness above thine, all thine abomination. What you do, that's what you're going to get as a judgment. Behold, every one that uses Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, as is the mother, so is her daughter. Thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children. Thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite and your father an Amorite. You were not a child of God to begin with. And thine elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand. And thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Now look at this. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if it were a little, very little thing, Thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty, committed an abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. You know the judgment of Sodom and Samaria. Neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thy abominations which thou hast done. Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, 
bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also and bear thy shame in that thou hast justified thy sisters. You make these sodomites look like Sunday school kids with all your wickedness. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them. When I bring everybody back, the remnant of these people, that thou mayest bear thine own shame and mayest be confounded in all that thou hast done and that thou art a comfort unto them. Let us see the just judgment of the Lord. When thy sister Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former estate and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. That's speaking only of those of the remnant of these groups. For thy system Sodom was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride. In other words, Israel had the same sin as Sodom, pride. Before thy wickedness was discovered as at the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria and all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abomination, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, judged by what they have done which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Breaking the covenant with the Lord. So the last four verses here are the repentant Jewish remnant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder, thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant not by that covenant. I will establish my covenant with thee and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth anymore because of thy shame when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord. Through this, the Lord will be glorified. And this is fulfilled. Zechariah 12, 9 and 10. And it has come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Glory to God. And in that day, which will be a great morning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hadarim and 
in the Valley of Megiddo because they see the return of the Lord and recognize him as the one that they have rejected. Revelation 1, 7 and 8. Behold, he cometh, speaking of Jesus, he cometh with clouds, every knee shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. I won't take time to go over this because we did that up at the top where those who accept Christ and his word and do it, perform it, live it, love it, walk in it, they are included with faithful Abraham and will be heirs according to the same promise. Praise the Lord for his word. This has been a long message. I realize that I was unable to cover it all, but it's all there for you to take it. It's an excellent study for you to understand more perfectly how God works what his will is, how he uses loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment to bring people back to him and how much he loves us. God bless you, and may you have a blessed time until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.